check. There we go. All right. Good morning, Cornerstone. Uh, Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. We are going to begin there in a moment. Uh, But first things first, if I can have uh, Glajimi Blaine and Alicia Gerald stand on up. <laughs> so if you were late to church, I wanted to take this opportunity. You remember we talked about being here at 945. You might have missed the screaming and the celebration that occurred when they walked in, but uh, just wanted to just lift them up. They got engaged on Friday. <laughs> So we are so excited, so excited for you all. Congratulations. You know, I've been getting to know uh, Glajumi uh, as we've been studying the Bible with Taman the last few, uh, since he moved here in November. And uh, he's just an awesome man of God, a great servant, a great disciple, very smart. Uh, He loves anime and games, and he can just nerd out about just about anything, which is cool. I'm a GT nerd, so, you know, we vibe in that way, and I really appreciate that. Uh, But I really love his heart for God and his heart for Lish. And uh, just so excited uh, for you, brother. And of course, of course, Lish, I can't say enough about you. What an amazing servant and minister, and just what a great, great woman of God you are. And so, so excited to have you on staff here to be a part of things. In addition to getting engaged on Friday, it was her birthday on Saturday. So, you know, so just an awesome, awesome weekend, and we are looking forward to a wedding later this year. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Amen. 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 Um, So uh, there was a minister who was sitting down with his son. His son had just gotten his driver's license, and he asked his father, hey, Dad, so when can I get the car? You know, I got the license. I want to take the car out. And Dad said, son, I'll make a deal with you. You get your grades up, uh, be, you know, doing your your Bible study and devotionals, get your hair cut, and then we'll talk about it. (laughs) And so a month goes by, and, uh, you know, the son had been doing some things. He comes back and, and, and meets back up with Dad and says, hey, Dad, you know what? I, I, I'm ready to discuss using the car. And the father says, son, I am so proud of you. You have brought your grades up. Uh, you've studied. You've been studying your Bible, be, doing your chores, but you still haven't gotten your hair cut. And, uh, you know, the young man waited a moment. He said, you know, Dad, I've been thinking about that. Samson had long hair. Moses had long hair. Noah had long hair, and Jesus had long hair. (laughs) To which his father replied, you know what, son, you're absolutely right. All those men had long hair, but they also walked everywhere they went. (laughs) Um, You know, and I I can relate to that. I have an 18-year-old, as you heard, who uh, who wants to drive and and all that. But it's interesting when you think about relationships between parents and their children, and there are oftentimes uh, needs and wants, and, and, and there are resources that you have, and they, you know, a lot of times you just sort of give things to them and take care of things for them, and then there comes an age where they want to partake of some of those resources on their own and different things like that. And, and, and you know, as I was thinking about fathers and sons, you know, we've been going through this book with and talking about sort of the four postures, right? We talk about life, uh, uh, life over God, life under God, life for God, and life from God. And these are incomplete postures. At, at first glance, they seem like, yes, this, this is possibly a way that I should relate to God, and this could maybe describe my relationship with God, but they all have something in each of them that they lack. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about this, and we've been talking a lot about us, and as we go through the book, it talks a lot about us. Well, I started to ponder the question, how does this relate to Jesus? You know, did Jesus ever struggle with any of these temptations to sort of just be for or from or under or over God? And so I started to look at some different scriptures, and I wanted to just kind of talk today about a few verses that describe sort of who Jesus is, and there's the temptations that he went through. And I do think that there's one posture in particular that we're going to talk about today that Jesus was very directly and explicitly tempted with. So first, I wanted to go through a few scriptures that sort of just discuss Jesus being the Son of God. You know, Tony did an amazing job uh, during the communion, just bringing us to the foot of the cross, so appreciative also of the worship and the teens. Man, it's always high energy and great and encouraging. Uh, 
uh, once a month when they get up and, and, and lead our worship service. And so you guys did a, did a phenomenal job. Uh, but, you know, thinking about God, um, thinking about God's son, Jesus being God's son. And what does that actually even mean? So over in Luke chapter 1, uh, you know, Mary, uh, the angel Gabriel comes to her and, and tells her you're highly favored, and she's afraid of this greeting, and then he says, I've got this announcement for you. He says, now listen, you're going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you're going to name him Jesus, and he will be called Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now that first part of it made a lot of sense to Mary. In, in Jewish thinking, uh, the second part where he says, He's going to sit on David's throne. If you were to read Psalm chapter 2, and there are several other what we call uh, kingly songs or kingship psalms, where in Israel, the king of Israel had a nickname, God's son. If you were the king of Israel, they said you are, it was sort of a nickname, a title you got, you were God's son. And so this first part is, is like, yes, that makes sense. I'm going to have a kid, and if he's going to sit on the throne, then he's going to be God's son. But, you know, she starts to thinking. And she's kind of like, well, hold up, Gabriel. Hold the phone here. I, I'm a virgin. So how is it possible that I'm going to conceive? You know, she, she, she understands how these things work. And she's like, I, I, I've never had relations. I've never been with a man. And so uh, Gabriel then says, listen, the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be, bought, to be born will be called the Son of God. And so, uh, one of the things that we see from this, from the very beginning, as Luke's sort of starting his story, is to, in a way, expect the unexpected when it comes to Jesus. So it was expected that, yes, the, the king would be God's son, right? It wasn't expected in anybody's imagination, I imagine, that God would come to this virgin and basically she would become pregnant with God's own seed. And so Jesus, in the literal sense, in terms of uh, he's the king of Israel, is God's son, but also in the physical sense that God literally put him inside of Mary's womb, he is God's son. And he goes on to talk about, listen, nothing is impossible with God. I know this is impossible for a virgin to have a child, but nothing is going to be impossible with God. And so Luke sort of starts off this story. The first thing we're sort of hearing about Jesus being God's son is we need to expect the unexpected and the impossible will be made possible. He goes on, you know, Jesus grows up. Um, he has that, that miraculous and remarkable birth, and then he grows up, and uh, we have another story lots of you are familiar with. When he's about 12 years old, he goes to the temple, or his family takes the trip. Uh, faithful Jews would go during Passover, during Pentecost, uh, during the Day of Atonement. They would always make these treks to Jerusalem. And so his family would do this every year, and they go, and, and Jesus stays behind in Jerusalem. And every time I read this story, I'm kind of like, how does this happen? And then I think about the times when, you know, I, I know some people that may have left their child at a, at a playground or at a gas station. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say any names. They, their name may rhyme with Myron Purd, but you know, uh, you know, and uh, you know, it's only, he said it's only happened twice. It's only happened twice. But it made me think about, you know, when you're at a family reunion. When you're at a family reunion, and your hair is down, and you're with your relatives and your cousins, and, you know, you're sitting around having dinner, at some point, you know, spouse man says, hey, have you seen little Johnny? And it's like, oh, he's around here somewhere, right? And that's exactly sort of what happened. So they make this journey. They, they start going back, and they realize that, you know, Jesus isn't there. And, and it's interesting, because I imagine he was the most responsible son that ever lived, so, was, you know, there was a whole bunch of grace and leeway that he probably got, but they realize he's not there, and then they spend three days looking for him. Three days. Now, again, that's some foreshadowing, right? Three days he would come back after the crucifixion. That's some foreshadowing. But you can imagine how they felt after three days. Right here it says, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. I love they use the word astonished there. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's the, the, the best word. What it makes me think of, you guys remember on the Cosby show, that episode, Night of the Wretched, uh, <laughs> when Vanessa had gone to Baltimore with her friends, and, you know, she had gone to have big fun in the city. 
and uh, you know, Claire, they finally track her down. Uh, they bring her back in the house. There's this scene, and Claire is just going off. And uh, it's funny, you know, Cliff doesn't even get a word in. And so when I think about Joseph here, I don't know, was he just so mad he couldn't say nothing, or was mom just so mad that he couldn't get a word in? <laughs> right? But I imagine that, you know, the emotions, there's a point in that scene where she says, we went from being in a frenzy to panic to distress, and now that we know that you are okay, rage, you know? <laughs> and I can imagine that maybe this is what Mary was feeling. The Bible summarizes We've been anxiously searching for you, you know. The Bible summarizes, but they, they, were, they, were, they were pretty upset, I imagine. And Jesus simply says, which I don't know if this reply would make me more upset, <laughs> why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? You could translate that, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be about my father's business? Could even be translated, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be with my father's people? And he said, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Again, understatement. <laughs> I don't know if they were so mad, so upset, so enraged. They, you know, they just had no words after that. It does say later that Mary treasured these things up in her heart. But, you know, the bottom line is even at a young age, at 12 years old, Jesus understood his relationship with his father was different. Right? There's something about Jesus being God's son, like this is my father's business and I need to be about it. Right? He, was, he was about his father's business. The next major episode in his life, which is what we're getting to over in Luke chapter 3, is his baptism. It says in Luke chapter 3 verse 21, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. As he was praying, heaven opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. Pardon me. With you, I am well pleased. You know, whether it was uh, with his birth or with his rebirth, one of the amazing things about this is we see right here at his baptism the appearance of the Trinity. Right? The Father speaking, the Holy Spirit descends on the Son who decided to get baptized. Again, it is not inconsequ inconsequential that we, when we decide to make a decision for Jesus, are baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, we're just imitating what our Lord, what, what happened essentially with our Lord here. Um, but uh, it's very interesting to think about. Uh, when you had the first humans created, God and a man, God took a piece out of the man, a piece from his side, right, and made a woman. And then here, you know, with Mary, uh, with Mary's uh, situation and Jesus coming up, you had God and a woman, and then Jesus was born. And so our God is a God of relationship. Our God is a God of togetherness. Our God is a God of being close, right, of wanting to be with us. But the thing I love about this is before Jesus had done one miracle— before he had done any teaching in a synagogue, before lots of proclamations that, that he would make about the future, before he was coming back to rule and all these things, right? Before he had done anything that you would think, man, now you're worthy of praise and honor, God says, you are my beloved son, and I am well pleased with you. You know, different from the minister and his son, right, that story where it's like, you got to get you do this, get your grades up, do X, Y, and Z. And he says, son, I'm really proud of you because you did these things. God says, son, I'm really proud of you because of who you are. And that is a lesson, I think, for every single one of us, right? God is proud of you because of who you are, because of whose image you were made in. The value that you have doesn't come from all the stuff you can do. Right? And so, yes, does he want to modify our behavior? Is, are there sins that we need to repent of? Are there behaviors that need to be changed in our life? Absolutely. But it doesn't change how he feels about you. And so we need to take this, you know, we need to take this lesson even from Jesus at his baptism that God is saying, you're beloved to me. And you know what? Any of us that has made this decision to follow Jesus, again, you come up out of that water, you didn't earn it. By believing, repenting, and getting baptized, you were just making a decision to follow the king, and he's saying, I am well pleased with you. It's interesting, though, uh, 
this act of humility that Jesus does in getting baptized, it's a little bit scandalous if you understand why, if you understand the following. So John the Baptist came on the scene preaching a baptism for what? Repentance for what? Forgiveness of sins. Now, one of the major points of theology of our religion is that Jesus was without sin. So, mm, two plus two is five? I don't, you know, I, I, why would Jesus, who's imperfect, um, who's perfect, need to go have a baptism for repentance and forgiveness of sins? And I love the fact that the Bible doesn't actually spend a whole lot of time trying to explain it. God is c- comfortable with you being uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, imagine the scandal, right? So you're saying he's the Messiah. You're saying he's God in the flesh. Well, why did he get baptized for repentance and forgiveness of sins? Matter of fact, even John, the Baptist, tried to stop him. He's like, no, no, you need to be baptized in me. Why am I doing this for you? And Jesus simply said, let this be done for all righteousness' sake. The act of humility, that act of humility, again, not what you expect. And so when you see all these passages about Jesus and his sonship, What it often will lead, or what it should lead us to ponder, what it should lead us to think about, is this question. What does it mean to be the Son of God? What did it mean for Jesus in his time to be the Son of God? You see, it wasn't just the fact that he was going to be king, so that made him God's son. It's because he's God's son that he is king. He is a Son of God par excellence, right? I mean, he is the example of what it means to be the child of God. And this question about Jesus is going to lead us to an important uh, question, important perhaps revelation and reflection for ourselves. But first, I wanted to uh, let you think a little bit about this. What is the enemy's answer to this question? What does Satan say in response to this question? It actually comes up in the scripture. Satan responds or tries to tell Jesus what it should mean for him to be the Son of God. And, and, and sadly, lots in the religious world have adopted Satan's line of thinking. It goes a little bit something like this. I love how Sky summed it up. If you're, if you're new here, we've been going through this book with, right? For, uh, this is sort of our theme for the year. We want to be with God and with one another. And there's a great book written by Sky Jathani. He talks about those four postures that I was mentioning earlier. But he says this. In many cases, talking about, you know, essentially religious people that live in the life from God posture, in many cases, they don't actually desire God, just his supernatural help. Sometimes it is called consumer Christianity, the prosperity gospel, or health and wealth preaching. In each case, people are looking to God as a cosmic therapist or a divine butler. He's what one friend has called the WD-40 duct tape combo pack, all you need to fix just about everything. And, you know, and as I read this, I see it, I know it's true, and I realize it's true because I struggle with it. And maybe you don't. Maybe it's just one of the other postures. I think for me, the biggest one that I struggle with is probably life for God, but there's definitely a lot of this too. There's definitely this idea that essentially what I want God to be is the genie of the lamp. <laughs> Shout out to Aladdin. For those of you, there are two kinds of people in the world. There's those of you that know that, Disney, that Aladdin is the greatest Disney movie, and there are the rest of you that are wrong. Okay? <laughs> rest, rest, I know, Lion King, Frozen, you know, some of y'all don't throw some stuff out there, but you're wrong. <laughs> Lion King's number two, but... You know, uh, rest, re, re, <laughs> rest in peace to Robin Williams. But, you know, um, it, it's very interesting. We laugh about it, but I know I've been this way in my life at times. It's very much like God is just, I've got these wishes and you've got to do them. You've got to serve me for the stuff I want or need. And I can treat him very much like that genie. And it's really interesting. Anybody know? So right after Jesus' baptism, uh, you have uh, the genealogy where it talks about he was thought to be the son of Joseph. And it goes on down the genealogy and it ends with the son of God. Anybody know what the very next story is after the baptism of genealogy? The temptation. And in Luke chapter 4, you've got the temptation. 
And it's very interesting, as we go through this temptation of Jesus, as you're going to read, you're going to see that by and large, Satan is tempting Jesus with this idea of life from God is what you should expect. If you're God's son, he ought to be doing some stuff for you. And I know that I can very much, you know, I can very much struggle with this too. I think there are a lot of good-hearted people and, you know, good-hearted people that have accepted this idea that a relationship with God is nothing more than he needs to be my genie. Give me health and wealth, take care of me, and, and, and do all these things for me. Fix any problem that I have. And it's going to be very, it, well, at least it was very interesting for me to see that Jesus, uh, Jesus was tempted with this exact same temptation. It's interesting, though. I can understand part of it, though. Uh, it is very true. Jesus will go on later to say that God is a good, good father, and every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And he'll say, ask, seek, receive, right? Knock, and you'll find. And so there's a part of us that says, but it is somewhat true. And I love what, you know, when I'd done, um, uh, I guess it was Life Under God, and Greg did the, the, the following sermon, you know, I love how he pointed out that there's some stuff, there's good stuff about being under God. And I think there is some good stuff about being, you know, saying, I want to live life from God. He is my provider. We live in a country of, I did that, I built that, I pulled up my bootstraps, and I made it happen. We live in a society that lives that way, right? And so there's, there's, there's a, a shift that has to occur in our perspective to truly understand it all comes from him. You, you, are, you are blessed and in a lot of cases lucky to have what you have. Lucky to be born in the zip code you were born in. Lucky that your parents stayed together. Lucky that people who did a bunch of stuff before you were even here made decisions that impacted your life. And ultimately God allowed that to happen because he wanted to use it for your glory. But a lot of times we want to take credit or if we don't, we just want to look at God like our genie to just fix stuff for us. So let's read this temptation scene. Over in Luke chapter 4 and verses 1 through 13. It says, Then Jesus left the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. Pardon me. And when they were over, he was hungry. I wouldn't just be hungry. I'd probably be hangry. Hungry and angry, right? Uh, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone. So then he took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for here. From here, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed him for a time. You see it? You see the health and wealth that he's promoting? The interesting thing about it is, Satan doesn't even try to use modern philosophy. He doesn't just use, you know, fancy, tricksy words or riddles or poems from that time of day. He uses scripture. And I think that's very the, the, the same issue that that life from God posture. We can sort of take and pluck out scriptures and say, oh, that prayer of Jabez, that's meant for me too. That thing that Jesus said to the Israelites, oh, that's meant for me too. And the thing is, yes, the Bible is written for us, but not everything in there is written to us. We can learn about God's character. We can learn about his principles. We can learn about how he operates. And yes, a lot of the same stuff he did then, he wants to do now. But that doesn't mean that I can pull this one verse out and say, oh, you know, God's going to enlarge my territory and give me everything I want because he did that for Jabez. Or, you know, Hezekiah prayed and, and God put this many more years on his life, so I know he's going to do that for me too. And we can sometimes get this idea that, you know, he's just going to be my genie. And, and, and I think that's exactly what Satan was doing here. It's just, it's an incomplete way to look at God. Think about the stone and the bread. The stone and the bread. What is he really asking him for? What is he really saying here? He's saying, why should God's son go hungry? I mean, you're God's son. If anybody don't need to go, you shouldn't go hungry. You de if anybody out there doesn't need to go hungry, aren't you the king? Aren't you God's son? Why are you going hungry? Listen, just tell it to be, tell it to be bread. You got, just do it. God will do it for you. 
It's very interesting. It makes me think about uh, essentially what Satan's trying to tempt him with. We live in a world that says, well, y'all love each other already. Y'all getting married anyway. You might, this one. Check, check. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> it, was, it, it was user error. It was probably me, not them. I, you know, I did something. Um, but we literally live in a world of, you're getting married anyway. Y'all really just move in together. You need to try it out and make sure it's going to really work. It's interesting. Uh, if you were to go on the lot of very, very expensive, not that I ever have, because I ain't got no money like that, but a very, very expensive cars, they don't let you test drive them. You don't just get to take. You don't get to take the Rolls Royce off the, off the lot to test drive it. But that lemon, you know, at, at Joe's Auto and Less, right? <laughs> Joe's Auto for Less. Now, he may not want you to test drive it to see, you know, but when something is of value, right, you got to put the full commitment in before you get to have it, before you get to use it. But we live in a world that says, right now, I want it right now. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you ever seen that movie Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith, right? And there's a scene where he's, he's smoozing, he's meeting all these guys, handing out cards, he's talking, and he's making all these great connections. And there's one guy says, dude. I, I, sound great. Your company's great. You're the new guy. I, you, no, I'm not, I'm not going to get my business over, but let's, let's build this relationship. Right? And so I think in our brains, we understand that. We understand that things work, that it's a process, that, that, you know, it's not just, things aren't just given to you most of the time, that you have to have hard work, you have to go through some stuff, there's going to be challenges, right? And God, I think, designed the world to be that way because it builds character, And so the question becomes, am I bowing down to whatever Satan is offering so I can have X right now? Whether that's going around, figuring out ways to cheat on your taxes, shady deals just to make the profit, lying about numbers at work just to look good. Well, I mean, I don't know what it is for you, right? But the shortcuts, I think in and of ourselves, we know there are, the the, the secret is there are no secrets. (laughs) There is no shortcut, But that's what Satan wants to offer every time. Thirdly, the temple. There's a couple things going on here when he he talks to him about the temple. He's essentially saying, you can do reckless, stupid things and God will bail you out. (laughs) Jump down. Let's look at the scripture. He's not going, he ain't going to let, he ain't going to let none of that. You his boy, right? You his son. (laughs) Jump down. And I know, you know, that idea of, I I definitely had been there, especially before I was a Christian, this idea of, you know what, I'm going to do this reckless, crazy thing, and tomorrow morning I'm just going to get up and ask for forgiveness. Or when when I make this conscious decision, I know this is sin, and I know this ain't right, and I didn't get no advice about that, and I didn't pray about it, I'm just going to do it because I want to do it, but you know what, if it turns out, God's going to bail me out. That's essentially what Satan is trying to tempt him with. And I know I've been there. The other thing is, back to this idea of glory now. He was basically saying, listen, jump down. You're going to be saved, and everybody's going to praise you. Everybody's going to see that you're God's son. Again, back to, you can have it all now. You don't have to wait. Show yourself to the world through this spectacular miracle. You deserve it, Jesus. You deserve it. Definitely understand been there at different times in my life. I'm stressed. I'm frustrated. I deserve to take the edge off. I'm looking at some pornography. I'm going to turn to the bottle. I deserve it. I had a long week. I deserve a couple extra drinks. Weed is legal in California. It's only a matter of time for it's here. I need to just, I need to take the edge off. Right? I deserve it. And that's essentially what Satan was trying to tempt him with. Why shouldn't you have it, Jesus? Thirdly, I I think the idea here is he takes him up on the temple, and I can imagine Jesus is up there, and he's seeing all the people walk around. And and Satan's idea here is, you know what, Jesus? You're above all of them. 
which there's some truth to that. He is the, the name above all names, the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? But if you remember back when he was 12 years old, he said, you know what my father's business is? It's not to be above them. My father's business is to be with the people. I got to be about my father's business to be with the people. And so what this question should lead us to, when we look at what Jesus went through, the question that was asked of him, what does it mean to be God's son? It's not what Satan was presenting. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, what does it mean for us to be followers of the Son of God? And he, you know, we don't have time today, but he spent many, many chapters in Luke talking about, this is what it means to follow me. This is what it means. It's not just about rights and privileges. Sometimes it's about sacrifice. Sometimes it's about, you know, not getting what you want when you, when you want it, but God will take care of your needs, right? It's, it's about living a life with me, not from God, with God. It's interesting, when you get to Jesus being condemned, they charge him, say, are you the Messiah? He's like, you've said it, but not only that, I'm going to be seated on the right hand of God and coming on the thrones of power. They say, are you God's son then? Again, back to that question, are you then God's son? Yes, it is as you say. And they then tear their clothes, spit in his face, and beat him. He was condemned for just telling the truth. Yes, I am God's son. Finally, in his death, I want to take the time. It's a little bit longer, but I just want to read it because I think God's word is way more powerful than the stuff I could say. But I want you to think about, you know, what by the end of his life, what is Jesus showing here that it means to be God's son? Over in Luke chapter 23 and verse 32, it says, "Two two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself as this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was written above him. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. And so, you know, as I think about this. And think about this story and what Jesus went through. There's two things that I want to sort of point out. The first is really the section in the middle when he's on the cross and he's dying. And essentially, more or less the same questions that Satan was saying. If you're God's son, then. Matthew's version, in Luke's version, they don't use the term son of God. They use the chosen one, Messiah, king of the Jews. In Matthew's version, they say over and over again, if you're really God's son, why didn't he save you? Same question Satan was asking. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Get, make that bread. Save yourself. You're hungry. And I, I, I love the, the thief at the end. He says, you know, one guy says, hey, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. And it's back to the unexpected. It's back to the making the impossible possible. You know, God's signature on something. You know what God's signature on something is? It's paradox. When you want to see God's fingerprints on something, it's irony. The irony here is it was not possible for Jesus to save himself and us. A choice had to be made. Save himself, come down from the cross because you're God's son and you don't deserve to go through this pain. Or go through it and save us. And I am so grateful that I serve a God that wanted to be with us so bad that he was willing to let his son die in my place. 
And so that's the first part about this that is so striking and so remarkable. What it means for Jesus to be God's son is, I'm going through this. I, the, the, God became a man, right, so that the sons of man could become gods, essentially. We get to be with God. Right? He made a choice to leave heaven and leave everything behind, to come here, live a, live a very difficult and tough life, not taking care of his own needs in a lot of situations, so that we could have all the riches and glory in Christ. The second thing that really stands out about this to me is really kind of his opening phrase and his last phrase on the cross, as recorded by Luke. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. You know, the cross for Jesus starts and ends with his sonship, with God's fatherhood. He starts off, what it means to be God's son, what does it mean to be followers of God's son, is that forgiveness should be like the air that we breathe. The forgiveness that he's able to offer when people are killing him. God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He didn't just say it, he practiced it. In the garden, they come to arrest him, and Peter cuts off a guy's ear. He picks up the man's ear and heals it. These are the people coming to arrest him. And you're saying, I know for me, sometimes I'm saying, I can't forgive. This morning, Chloe did an amazing job singing. I was, I was extremely proud of her. And this is in spite of, I was kind of being a jerk this morning. She was running a little late. And, you know, I, uh, and I get there's sometimes a time, teach the lesson. I get it. That is, there is a time. But I was so kind of, I need to teach her this lesson about not being on time. And so I, I was like, you need to ride with Grandma Betty. I'm leaving. But she made it right to the car, and then, I, you know, I made her change clothes, and she was clearly, and I, I just, I, mean, I didn't think, she's singing a song today, she's supposed to be sharing about swamp, I just thinking, I need to teach this lesson right now. And as I was driving, I literally thought, you know, let's say, so there have been times when, uh, you know, the words or other kids have spent the night with us, you know, on a Saturday night. If they were running late. Would I have done that to them? There was not grace. There was not forgiveness. Natasha called me after. She was like, honey, I think you were wrong here. There was not grace and forgiveness that I so often need. I was late to our meeting this morning. So, Chloe, I'm really sorry that I did that to you this morning. You did an amazing job today. I'm very sorry that I didn't have grace for you this morning. I love you too. But Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Is that my attitude? That's what it means to be a child of God, to have those kind of relationships where I forgive people because look what I'm able to be forgiven of. And lastly, he ends with, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm going to give this life to you. Uh, whatever it is that you want me to do, whether it's Hosea and Gomer, which is for me one of the hardest stories in the Bible. Go marry an adulterous woman, he told Hosea. Because I want to make an example for the Israelites. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you're going to go through that flaming fire. Because one day it's going to be written about. And people are going to be able to take comfort and encouragement that when they're walking through the fire, there is one like a son of man that is walking with them. Am I willing to say like they said, even if he doesn't save me? I'm not bowing down. I don't need the kingdom right now. I don't need right now delayed gratification. Going to heaven to be with him forever, that is worth more than whatever I could concoct for myself right now. When Jesus was in the garden praying, right? I know, God, we've been planning this for millennia. I know we said this is what we're going to do to save people, but hey, is there a ram in the bush? Is there any other way? You, you did it for Abraham. Father, is there, is there another way? And God told Jesus no so that he could tell you yes. And so what it means to be a son of God, what it means to be a follower of the son of God is, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. A man was once asked, what do you gain by a relationship with God? What do you gain by prayer? What do you gain by praying to God, by talking to God? Jesus praying to God in his, his last breath, right? What do you gain? The man said, I gain nothing. 
But let me tell you what I lose. I lose anger. I lose selfishness. I lose doubt, insecurity. I lose fear of death. I lose uh, addictions. I lose, and by losing all of that, that is how I gain. Life from God says you just need to give God, you need to gain from God. Life with God says, I'm entrusting my spirit. I'm trusting my life to you. I know that you're going to take care of me. As long as I am with you and you are with me, I'm going to be good. So my encouragement today, what does it mean to be a son, a daughter, a child of God? It means that, you know what? It's life with God that we strive, not life from God. He's not my genie. He's my buddy, my best friend. He is my provider, right? But some of the things that I go through, he's using these situations for his glory, for his purpose. And I need to say, Father, when it comes to my relationships, I'm going to be like you. And whatever forgiveness needs to be extended, I don't know what it is in your life right now. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's an uncle or a cousin or somebody or something that happened to you, right? That Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I know a lot of times it seems like that is not true. When that person hurt me, they knew exactly what they were doing. But ultimately, Jesus sitting on that cross saying, they don't really truly understand. God, what it means to be a follower of the Son of God is I live like that. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And secondly, it means that my life is entrusted to you, not just what I can get from you, but because I'm going to walk with you from now until that delayed gratification of glory in forever. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Amen.